So okay. let's kick off. Hi everybody, I'm Sarah, I'm the Clinical Director for Nawala and with us today we are really honoured and excited to be speaking to William who is the founder of Stammer Stories podcast and is a public speaker about stammering. So William, welcome, thank you for joining us today. Well, well thank you so much for having me, really excited to talk about the different topics and yeah. So why don't we kick off, William, why don't you tell everybody a bit about yourself, your journey? Sure. So I've had a stammer my whole life. I've not known life without a stammer. I was told that I wouldn't be able to speak properly until I was around seven or eight years old. And I had speech therapy for the first 10 years of of my life. And then I went to secondary school, didn't really have that much speech therapy because you were at that age where it doesn't get provided to you. And then I went to a school with 70 students to a school, to a college with 4,000 students. So the anxiety of changing uh, play locations caused my stammer to get bad. And then I went to Michael Palin Centre. And since then, I'm a stambassador for actual stammering children, where I help inspire young people who are transitioning from edu education to the workplace and aren't afraid of the big wide working world. But also just seeing how the big, how, how stammering is not really spoken about and there's so many things that are so interesting about the topic that needs to be shared. Well, I think there was something William, because William and I met last week to have a chat and obviously I'm a speech and language therapist so it was a really useful conversation because we were both talking about stammering from different perspectives which we're going to do today but one thing we I thought would be nice to touch upon to start off with is what's it actually called and who's calling it what so when I talked about it when it, we're at university it's the formal name of um, disfluency but William what have you always known it as? I've always known it as stammering and a stammer that's always just what I've been told and, and sort of what I'm used to and I guess like the Michael Palin uh, Centre Stammering and Actual Stammering Children Stammer the British Stammering Association I think it's just that bigger term but I was talking to someone from the States and, and they never call it stammering they always say stuttering and like it oh. the someone from Australia who I was talking to they call it stuttering like it makes you wonder if it's just a cultural um a cultural thing or sort of if it's sort of like the twangs of the accent so if the stuttering is maybe of how it's pronounced more or but i've always known it as stammering what have you known people to call it as so when we've had referrals, we've had all three terms being used. My child's got a stutter, my child's stammering. I think my child has disfluent speech. Um, but as we said, I think the term disfluency is, is quite a negative term because yeah. from the word off, you're setting it up to be, well, it's something that's not working rather than something that is part of someone's existence and we're going to manage it and support it. Does that make sense? So using something like stammering and stuttering makes more sense to what it is. Disfluency, I think, can be very hard to understand. Yeah, plus I think it sort of, you know, we are trying to change it to be a positive thing rather than a negative thing. Then I think disfluency just doesn't sound right. And I think it does, well, it sums it up what stammering is, and it is, correct but I think it's just not the right term people should be using in in a general setting. So now we've cleared it up we're going to call it stammering. <laughs> <laughs> what was your what's your experience has been like with speech and language therapy throughout your life? So I clearly remember, I was saying this song, but I clearly remember the exact room where I did my speech therapy in, and it was more sort of techniques like Sit the slide, um, uh, something to do with a beat, and there's certain techniques that would just help me in like school and presentations. And then because it was more about the communication side of things and certain everyday things. For, and then when I went to the Michael Payton Center, that was more like embracing your stammer and like learning techniques, but they pushed you. So you would go to 
someone from a public uh, go up to a stranger in public, which is absolutely terrifying for someone with a stammer, to ask for directions or then go ask for directions from a nearest shop. And it, it was terrifying because you just had to do it rather than, but it taught you how your brain overthinks it more than you think. And I think you also look at how much you think about your stammer more than other people do. And is and we've got talk the iceberg method, like the iceberg. So what's shown above the iceberg and what's shown when you when you can really relate to what they to the emotions beneath, but also what's above it as well. I think it must have been quite challenging as well, thinking about your your school journey to have gone from a very small, familiar environment to a huge college. And as we know, with speech therapy, with so many young people who work with regardless of their communication needs, that can be a huge, huge jump um, yeah. to manage. What kind of advice would you give to any kind of young person who was having to make that big educational move? I One of the big things for me, because my school was for people with learning difficulties, so dyslexia, dyspraxia, stammering, and because I, I was going to the mainstream college, that was what I was terrified about, was going to a college where every normal sort of else was normal and like they may have not been used to someone stammering so I always thought how would they cope with hanging around with someone with a stammer but actually you don't know until you actually experience it yourself and I think just own it like my main advice is just own your stammer straight away and that's and when you realise that, if you sort of forget about it as such, then you just feel way more relaxed just talking about it. And I just say, like I said to my friends, I do have a stammer, nothing's wrong with my voice. And then just, but you'd be surprised how much people don't really care. And so I'm like, just like, okay, sure, no, they just accept it. Brilliant. I think as well, from my perspective as a speech and language therapist, and this can be applied to, to most people with communication needs, is giving the, the person time, yeah. time to process, time to think, time to respond. And as human beings, we're naturally inclined to fill a silence. So I'm gonna to count to 10 seconds now in absolute silence, and let's see how everybody on this Insta Live feels. Oh! Yeah. Dying to get back and talk. But we call that the 10 second rule and it's something that we use a lot as speech therapists that we would work with to support with people. And I think that would always be my top tip when you're um, with someone who's stammering is to give them that time. And even just counting in your head using the 10 second rule creates that space. You can crack on and do what you're doing, but the other person is giving you that time. There's no pressure because they're busy counting as it were. And the other thing that I think you all agree with William is don't try and be helpful and yeah. finish what they're saying? Like, I definitely think that most of the problem around stammering is that people think that they're helping, but actually they're doing the wrong thing. And sometimes, like, we would love to be helped, but it's harder to help when you don't know what, A, we're going to say. And I think, what's the rush? What's the time pressure? What's that extra five seconds? We're going to be talking in those five seconds further down the chat, like we're going to not make up the time but we're still going to be talking in the next five seconds of what's the rush for that instant word when no one's fluent perfectly like we all sort of stammer in our own way like if we're nervous or then I think we just need to realize that you don't know what the other person's going through because they may just be really nervous and they, and they could be a very shy person or they may have a stammer or they may not speak the language who you're talking to. So they so never really know how you should just give people time. So William, as someone who's had speech therapy and you're sitting with a speech and language therapist, have you got any questions for me? Anything you want to ask? What's the biggest, um, what sort of technique do you get asked about? The most of what's the one number technique that you would give to someone who stammers? Well, we've talked about what technique you give the person you're listening to. I think someone who is stammering, the most important thing is not 
things not to do. So I, you, most people would say, oh, take a deep breath. Don't do that. That is categorically the worst thing you can do if someone has a stammer because it creates an irregular breathing pattern. So a lot of people who I see would have come to me having had that advice by a teacher or someone thinking they've been helpful because th that makes sense. Isn't it? If you take a deep breath, it gives you time to slow down, but it's creating an irregular air pattern. So my, my tips are the do nots. So do not do that. And this in terms of thinking about your style, especially with a teenager or an older person, is the iceberg method, which you yourself have used. It's an old classic, but the classics work. And it really helps break down your understanding and awareness of the stammer and exactly what you said, owning it. It's part of you. It's yeah. who you are. What we can do is give you the management strategies around it. And I think, as every speech therapist will know, the Michael Payne Centre is the place that you go and all the works that we would be using on our trainings would come from there as well in terms of the management and and the approaches that we would use there are other ones i don't even heard, heard the lidcom approach that's no. quite a classic um one it, it could be that you've had the, the therapy but it's been subsumed in different techniques um but yeah if I had someone who was stammering, there are some really good like parent-child interaction work you can do, uh, very much like what we talked about, creating an opportunity for the child to speak, taking turns. I watched work with one family, the boy was, because there seems to be a higher rate in boys, not being sexist, but that's just what the evidence shows. Um, and they were all talking across each other at dinner times, and he had a very dominant older sister. And it literally was, I gave him a wooden spoon. And whoever held the wooden spoon was the one who got to talk. And I said, you eat meals three times a day. I want you to do three times a day for a week. And he would, had gone from really locking, he'd moved on to, so really couldn't even get out the first sounds, um, to by the end of that first week, was saying short sentences with very smooth speech. Literally, because we'd physically given him that space that he knew if he held wow. the spoon, nobody else would talk. Have you found that stammering in more people, like more people who stammer, have more like a blockage stammer rather than like a like a softer stammer? What which do you see more of? Do you see it because mine's sort of more of a blocky stammer, but I know some people who have quite a sort of a they really pronounce the first letter of each word. So there are three kind of your main types, which is the blocking, like you said, where you, you just get completely stuck. And that's where a lot of secondary um, behaviours might come in, like physical tics. So if I meet, meet someone who may be a teenager who hasn't had that intervention as you, you had earlier on, they might have developed like a head shake or a physical movement because they're physically trying to get the word out. So that's that can be quite a severe case as well because then you're dealing with different things to manage. The other two are repetitions. So you do say the first sound, but you just keep saying it for a bit, and then the, then the words click, click in, as it were. And the other one is a prolongation where you, you prolong the sound. So the sounds come out, but it's a very long sound. Those are the three main types. I've seen a variety, and I, it also, I think it depends on age as well. It can depend how long the stum has gone on untreated. There could be secondary factors involved, like I work with children very high anxiety. So blocking can be more common sometimes with that because it, it fits with the profile. But there's a real mix. But those are the three main ones, if you're a speech therapist, that you would be looking out with. If someone came to you with a stammer, that's what you'd be thinking about and that's what you'd be looking for. Well, and I guess one question that I would say, for people who don't stammer, who may have joined us today, how would you sort of teach them to stammer so they know what it's like for someone how do you sometimes train to tell people how to stammer so they know how it feels for someone who does stammer? Well, I've worked a lot with younger children. I, we call it the mother-in-law technique, we call it the grandparent technique, because the family unit who will live with that child every day is very well versed on what their child needs and what support they do, but it's, it's normally the wider family circle it can be slightly more challenging, challenged in their understanding um, that she's not saying please, thank you, she's not being rude, she, she really can't get the words out. 
So sometimes with them, I have done it. So like, as well as I teach the 10 second rule, I would also do try blocking. Right, now we're gonna, I want you to say the cat is on the mat, but I want you to repeat the first sound of each word 10 times. So they get to feel Perfect. it, William, do you know what I mean? And then that's where it, 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 it was like anything in life, once you've experienced it, then you understand it a bit more, you know? So yeah, it's obviously, it's more the wider family circle. <laughs> do you like that? And the mother-in-law technique, that was what one mum said to me. So it got called that, but I always put the grandparent technique. <laughs> Yeah, I really like, and it's weird, like, like, I'm doing a podcast, I, I'm noticing different techniques that people are using, like, throughout talking, so I'm now seeing, like, different techniques, which before I could never tell, but I can now see, like, because e every technique is different for every person who's done this, and I, like we said with our call last week, that you can give five people the same recipe, but they will all do a different take on how they make it. And I think that's the same with different techniques. I mean, you could give us all the same technique, however, we will all use it in our own different way to adapt it to ourselves. And I got taught the camp down method, which is what I use quite a lot. And I was showing someone over the weekend the camp down method, and it's really hard to explain without showing them like examples of how to do it and, and when you sort of sometimes forget there are so many times where I can just use this but I may be too conscious to use it in these situations do you think people are less likely to use techniques in public than they may would if they were at home I think so and I think that's very common with a lot of teenagers that I'd work with like you said, when you moved to the college, your big concern was it was mainstream. They didn't have similar needs and that anxiety pressure that comes in. So, yeah, I think the older child or the young, young person. If anybody watching has any questions or any tips and advice as we're chatting away, do feel free to comment in the comment box. We'd love to hear from you. I hope you're enjoying it. Um, William does have a very active podcast which is brilliant and you've had some fantastic guests um on it um what kind of tips or advice or strategies have you seen them use when you've been interviewing them i i've realized like that lots of people are sort of like doing um they sort of do a block but they're doing a deep breath when they block so mm -hmm. and then it's a really deep sound and like you can tell that once they relax or they may go let me say it now and like they may stammer first or then they'll go let me start again now and then they can just say it straight away without stammering at all like sometimes like, I've noticed that people have to stammer first to then just repeat themselves and then I was talking to Jess who's on TikTok who's in stammer awareness on TikTok and, and I noticed how like, she could stammer really badly sometimes, but then further throughout the episode, when Water was just confident, like talking, her stammer was still there, but you can just tell that she was more comfortable in either question format or to go, no, let me repeat that. Like, I think it's just, just remember to say it is okay to start again. If you don't, because sometimes when you stammer, you get flustered and you think, Oh God, oh God, what's happening, what's happening? Feel free just to start again and just go, no, let me just start again. And then your brain sort of relaxes and then you can go forward. And then you're less likely to stand, you're likely to stand with less because you've thought about what you're going to say. And then, then say it. It's really useful. We've had one question when you come in. I want to ask you first. Um, it says... It's from G. Howlett. Any advice or tips for people that, who have started stammering as an adult? I'd say just own it straight away. And, and just talk, the more you talk about it, the more comfortable you'll be. And what I found is the more comfortable you are in, 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 in your stammer, the more, the, the less likely you are to stammer because it's not on your forefront of your thoughts all the time and I think if you're trying to hide it you're thinking about it more have you do you think that like when you're thinking about 
something that you're trying to hide your or you're thinking about it way more than you would be if you just embrace it yeah i absolutely agree with that from a speech therapy perspective especially if you have started stammering as an adult i would um, seek the advice of a speech and language therapist who specializes in working with adults one to give you strategies and about the management but also to break down what's happened and why it's occurring now is it due to um, a lot of difficulties happen that some of the sometimes when adults have strokes um, it can be like a secondary effect or is has it just suddenly happened so I would definitely own it as William said um, and then seek out some management and then it's you're, you're dealing with it in a really positive way then yeah uh, plus I think it's just great that, that you're even reaching out saying that what advice and tips because that's great because the more you reach out and talk about it the more comfortable you'll be so, and then the more confident you'll have absolutely William, it's been really lovely talking to you, as always, again today. Um, and I hope for those that have joined us, you've had a really interesting insight into William's journey um, and just talking about making stammering um, positive, removing the stigma of it from both a professional and a personal opinion. It's been really great seeing you. Do check out William's podcast. You can find his details on our Instagram. And have a great rest of the day. Thank you so much, William. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.